You know, we're working with Calvin, our two-year-old, who's almost three now, trying to teach him good manners, right? So we're teaching him to say, you know, please and thank you, and he's okay at the please thing, but the problem is that he's kind of starting to see how he can use please to manipulate us a little bit, <laughs> right? And so now in his mind, it's not just, oh, I say please because it's kind, it's, well, I say please and then I get what I want, and so if it's not working, he's learned, okay, I've got to ham it up more. So, well, Daddy, can I have that? No, you can't have that. And he'll kind of turn his head and put on a big smile and say, please? Because he thinks, right, that's, that's what we do. And he thinks kind of the same thing with prayer. Well, because we pray before we eat. And so if the food isn't on his plate fast enough, he'll just go ahead and start praying before we get there. Because he knows, I pray and then we eat. So if I pray now, I get to eat. That's how things work in his mind, right? So we're working on that. And our, this problem is that we can actually come to believe that as well. That there are times that we don't grow out of that even as children and as we get older with God. We can start to think that if I do a certain thing, if I pray a certain way, if I say the right words, if I do this action, then God is going to do this for me. And that's what our story is this morning. We actually come to a fairly strange story in the middle of the book of Judges with Jephthah and his vow. When I told my wife Brianna this was the story we had this week, she laughed at me and said, good luck with that one. Um, and so what I want to do this morning is show us part of what this strange story has to teach us. What I think this story is all about is really about man's attempt to manipulate God and to get God to do what he wants to do. And we'll see how that goes. So if you would, if you have your Bible in front of you, if you'd turn to the book of Judges, we're going to be starting in chapter 10 in verse 6, and we're going to go all the way to the end of chapter 12. I want to remind you of why we, why we do this, as Dale reminds us every week as well. We're, we're here for God. We're not here for us. We sing not because we love the songs and they're so wonderful, but because we love the God that we sing about. And we read this book, and I read it all the way through before we talk about it, because we believe this book is God's Word. And you're here this morning not really to listen to me, we're here to listen to God. And so we read His Word all the way through, even though it's strange and long and sometimes might be weird, because this is God's Word, and His Word matters. So if you're able, and if you can, would you stand with us as we read His Word together? The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And they served the Baals and the Asheroth and the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites and the gods of the Philistines. They forsook the Lord and did not serve Him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And He sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites. And they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year for 18 years. They oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan and the land of the Amorites, which was in Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the walls. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, Did not I save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and the Ammonites and the Philistines, the Sidonians also and the Amalekites and the Maonites oppressed you and you cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore I will save you no more. Go out and cry to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. The people of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them, and they served the Lord. And he became impatient over the misery of Israel. Then the Ammonites called to arms, and they encamped in Gilead. And the people of Israel came together, and they encamped at Mizpah. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. And Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. And Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob and gathered worthless fellows, collected around Jephthah, and went out with him. 
After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did not you hate me and drive me out from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in distress? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites, then the Lord and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be witness between us if we don't do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all the words before the Lord at Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said, What do you have against me, that you've come to me to fight against my land? And the king of the Ammonites answered the messengers of Jephthah and said, Because Israel, coming up from Egypt, took away my land from Arnon to Jabbok and the Jordan, and therefore restore it peacefully. And Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said to them, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up from Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Gadesh. And Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom and said, Please, let us pass through your land. But the king of Eden wouldn't listen. And they sent also to the king of Moab, but he wouldn't consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. And they journeyed through the wilderness and went around to the land of Edom and the land of Moab and arrived at the east side of the land of Moab and camped on the other side of Arnon. But they did not enter the territory of Moab, for Arnon was the boundary of Moab. And Israel then sent messengers to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, Please, let us pass through your land to our country. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So he, Sihon gathered all the people together and encamped at Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the land of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited the country. And they took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to Jabbok to the wilderness of Jordan. So then the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people, Israel. And you are to take possession of them? Will you not possess what Kamosh, your God, gives you to possess? And all that the Lord, our God, has dispossessed before us, we will possess. Now therefore, are you better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he ever contend against Israel? Or did he ever go to war with them? Well, Israel lived in Heshbon and all the villages and Aror and its villages and all the cities that are on the banks of the Arn in 300 years. Why did you not deliver them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you. And you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. So the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. And he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and he said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then... Whatever comes out of my doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Oror to the neighborhoods of Minith, twenty cities, as far as Abel Kiramin, with a great blow. And the Ammonites were subdued for the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. And besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes. And he said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. And you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I can't take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you've opened your mouth to the Lord. Do unto me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies on the Ammonites. And so she said to her father, let this thing be done to me. Leave me alone two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months and she departed. She and her companions and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. 
And the men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zephon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross to fight against the Ammonites and didn't call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you didn't save me from their hand. And when I saw that you wouldn't save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them to my hand. Why then have you come against me this day to fight me? And Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim, because they said, You're fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. So the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites, and when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over. The many of Gilead said, Are you an Ephraimite? And when he said, No. And they said, Well, then say Shebeleth. And he said, Sebeleth, for he couldn't pronounce it right. And then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. And at that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in the city of Gilead. And after a amusement of Bethlehem, Judge Israel, and he had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave in marriage outside of his clan, and 30 daughters he brought in from outside of his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then Nisbon died and was buried at Bethlehem. And after him, Elon the Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years. Then Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Ajalon in the land of Zebulun. And after him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Perethionite, judged Israel. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys. And he judged Israel eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Parathonite, died and was buried at Parathon in the land of Ephraim in the hill country of the Amalekites. The grass withers and the flower fades, but God's word stands forever. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would reveal your word to us. Lord, would your Holy Spirit come? Would you open our hearts? Would you open our ears? Would you open our eyes? Allow us to hear from your word what this ancient story has to teach us about you. And we pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So number one, if you're taking notes in your bulletin, is that the truly repentant will always find grace. The truly repentant will always find grace. Grace. This morning we find ourselves in the middle of the book of Judges, actually. We've been going through this book, and we're going to keep going through it, and this is kind of the middle part of it. And so we'll be over the hump after this morning. And Israel has been slowly declining, right? It's been time after time that they have abandoned God, and God has given them over to their enemies, and they cry out to God, and He sends a judge to save them, and then things are good for a while, judge dies, and then they go back and they sin more. And it just repeats and repeats and repeats. But as it's been repeating, it's been getting worse and worse. And here we find that they've done it again. But it's not just that they've done it again. They look at all of the different gods in 10.6. There are seven different gods that they are worshiping. The Baals, the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, Sidon, Moab, Ammonites, the gods of the Philistines. Every possible god that they could worship, that's the god they're worshiping. If you look, they're worshiping all of the gods from the nations that God's already saved them from. And they're worshiping the gods from all of the nations he's going to have to save them from at the end. All of their neighbors, every possible god that is nearby, they are grabbing onto. Other than the god who has saved them time and time and time and time again. So the people again, they come to God. It's been 18 years in 10.8 that they're being oppressed by yet another nation. But God responds differently now than he has before. He tells them in 10.14... I'll save you no more. Go out and cry to the gods whom you've chosen. Let them save you. All those idols, those gods you want to worship instead of me, you think they are helping your life more than I can? Go see how they save you. Go ask them for help. Good luck. I've say, and then he reminds them, he says, I've saved you seven times. I've saved you out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. And yet every time I save you and give you grace, you spit in my face and you turn around again. Go ask your new gods. That's what God says. So what are we to do with that? How are we to understand this? Is God turning his back on Israel forever? No. But what he is saying is he's not obligated to help them anymore. As you notice, all of these cycles, they're they're a little different. And there are many of them where the people don't actually repent. They just cry to God for help. Some that don't even cry to God for help. And yet God helps anyway. And yet, God shows up every time and saves them when they don't deserve it. What God is saying here is not that He's done with them forever. What He is telling them is, look, I'm done helping you if you're not really repentant. 
When you just come to me and you're just saying, sorry, sorry, God, we did it again, oops. And you're not actually sorry about it. I'm not going to save you anymore. Those days are done. But the people respond correctly. In 1015, they say, well, they hear it and they say, we've sinned. You're right, God, do whatever seems good to us. This is the right perspective. They don't say, God, that's not fair. They say, God, you're right. We don't deserve your grace. We don't deserve you to save us. You do whatever you think is right. Please, we, we'd love it if you would save us today. And then anyway, they go and they put away their foreign gods and they serve the Lord. Their response is one of repentance. They actually go through the motions. They don't wait for God to save them and then throw away their foreign gods. They do it now even though he hasn't promised to do anything for them. That shows that they actually are repentant. And in response to this repentance, what does God do? Then it says, and the Lord became impatient over the mercy of Israel. There is always grace for those who are truly repentant. And our repentance is revealed in our actions, not just our words. We know this when it comes to human beings or children. They say, oh, really sorry that I did that. Okay, well, are you sorry that you did it or are you sorry that you got caught? Are you sorry that you did it? Or are you sorry that now you have to go to time out? Are you sorry that you did it? Or are you sorry that now we have to have a conversation about it? And you're going to do it again in five minutes. There's a difference between being sorry and being repentant. And repentance is revealed in actions. It's revealed in actually doing something differently. Most of the time we're not really repentant. Most of the time we're just sorry we got caught. Most of the time we're just sorry we have to suffer some consequences for something. Most of the time we just want to kind of forget about it and let's move on. And maybe I'll try to do something different, maybe not. That's not real repentance. But what Israel does here is true repentance. And so what happens is God responds to them. You know, the grace, you know, we've sung about God's amazing grace. It is amazing. And it is wonderful. It is worth singing about until there's no more breath in our lungs. But God's grace can't be manipulated. God's grace is not cheap. It was paid for by the blood of His Son. Grace doesn't just come to any who just say, Hey, sorry, and they don't mean it. Grace is not, there's not magic words and a magic incantation that if you just say this, now you get it all. Grace comes for those who are truly repentant. This is part of why I struggle with those who will say, well, you know, everyone just has to go to heaven and be forgiven of their sins. Well, how can you really be forgiven if you're never sorry about anything? How can you be forgiven if you don't think you ever did anything wrong? Israel understands this. They really are repentant. And because of their actions that reveal their true heart, they find grace. God shows up. There's always grace for those who repent. God in this chapter isn't saying that His grace has run out and He's done. He's saying He's done giving it to those who aren't really asking for it. But those who ask will always find it. There is no sin that you can sin that God can't forgive. Even after making this declaration, God saves His people again. And He's going to do it again and again before this book is done. Even in the story of Samson before it's over. When people repent, there is always grace. Even throughout all the Old Testament, after every judgment, everything that God says, this is going to come to you, I'm done with you. If the people return and they repent, God always relents. There is always grace for those who repent. What does this mean? We just, but what it does mean, we can't just tell God, hey, sorry. It means we have to actually mean it. We have to actually be repentant. Uh, our second point this morning as we get into the story of Jephthah, is that bargaining with God ends in disaster. That bargaining with God ends in disaster. What we see is this is what Jephthah tries to do. I'm going to try and summarize it a little bit before we, we get into it. So the people, right, they've repented, but they appear to get a little impatient. Right? They they're don't seem to be happy in waiting for God to come and send them a judge. They want to go take care of it themselves is what appears to happen. And so they go and they find themselves Jephthah, who is a mighty warrior. He's somebody that you would pick. But his, his mother is a prostitute. And so his other brothers kicked him out because they didn't like him being around. But now they come desperately begging for his help, much like Israel has come desperately begging for God's help after they've kicked him out. And so Jephthah agrees that he'll help them and they promise they'll make him the king or the ruler or the head over them. 
And so Jephthah then gets into this long back and forth in chapter 12 with the king of the Ammonites. And they're going back and forth fight, talking about, well, why are we fighting? And they're kind of establishing this. And the king of the Ammonites is mad, saying, hey, you guys stole my land. This used to be our nation. How come you guys are here? That's why I'm fighting. I'm trying to get it back because it's ours. And Jephthah remind, gives them a history lesson, reminds them of what actually happened. I said, well, when we were slaves and God saved us out of Egypt, we were wandering. We were trying to head to our land. And we just wanted to pass through. And yet nation after nation told us, no, we couldn't even walk through your land to go somewhere else. And we came to your land. And we asked for help. And not only did you say, no, you can't, then you tried to come and kill us and wipe us out. Tried to slaughter the refugees at your gates. We didn't even set foot in your land until you came and attacked us. And then God defeated you. And he gave us your land. That's how it really happened, is what Jephthah says. So in, even in worldly terms, Ammon is the aggressor and Israel was the wronged party. And in this back and forth, Jephthah makes some profound theological statements. And in 11.27, he says, look, God's going to decide what's really going on. I, therefore, I haven't sinned against you and you do me wrong in making war on me. The Lord, the judge, the true judge, will decide this day between our people who is right. He acknowledges we're in a fight, and whoever wins, that's who God thinks is right. That's a good statement. He's declaring that God's in control of the destiny of nations, that once again God is going to deliver Israel in victory. And it's only going to become because of God, not because Jephthah is a great warrior. It's a great theological statement. Sounds like something a prophet would declare. But then it ends in 1128 and tells us, well, the king of the Ammonites didn't listen to the words of Jephthah. Problem is, I don't think Jephthah listened to his own words either judging by what happens almost immediately after it. Because if Jephthah truly believed, well, God is going to deliver us, he's going to deliver us, he's going to do it, then he wouldn't go and do what he does with this vow. So he goes and he makes a vow to the Lord, and this vow is a bargaining chip. I don't think it's him promising a big sacrifice. It doesn't seem to be an act of faith. There's places where people do this, but it usually happens afterwards, or it happens before. But now Jephthah's just trying to bargain with God. He's trying to make a deal. He begins to say in 11.30, well, if, it's a big if, if you give the Ammonites into my hand. What do you mean if? He just said before that God was going to do it. Well, now he's not quite so sure. He says, well, God, if you actually do what you've promised to do, well, God, if you do what I've already heard you say that you have done throughout every generation since I have been alive, and if you maybe do that again, then... Whatever comes out of my doors and my house, that I'll give to you. So he's cutting God a deal, or a gamble, if you will, or he's bargaining. He's God, I'll make a sacrifice to you, but you know, let's, let's play a game to see what it'll be. Whatever comes out of my house first, that's what you'll get. Maybe you'll get a really good deal, God. Maybe it'll be a cow. Or maybe it'll just be, you know, a chicken. But you know, it could be really good, God. I'll, you know, whatever you want, whatever's first, that's what you can get. We'll let chance decide. <laughs> Seems like Jephthah's trying to sacrifice as little as possible. All right? If he was willing to make a big sacrifice for God, then he would tell him what it is. But he's trying to make a deal. And the irony here is that God already knows. All right? We believe that God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's already in the future. He knows exactly what's coming out of the house first. Yet Jephthah thinks he can trick God. And this is a common practice, these kinds of vow makings with gods in pagan nations, but this isn't and shouldn't be a common practice for God's people. Jephthah's not doing something wise here. And the problem is that I don't think the story of this is that Jephthah just cut a bad deal. He should have promised or vowed something different to God. The problem is that he is trying to manipulate and bargain with God. He is trying to guarantee that God will show up and do what Jephthah wants him to do through this vow and through this prayer. And if he makes a good enough deal, then God will do what I want to do. That's what Jeff is trying to do. And the word for whatever there, when he's saying, then whatever comes out of my house, is pretty vague. It's actually not really clear if Jeff is thinking only about animals or if humans are included in that as well. It's clear at least that he has some idea of human sacrifice and life as a possibility. If it wasn't a possibility, if he was just saying, now whatever animal comes out, then when his daughter came out, he wouldn't have been upset about it. That thought wouldn't have even entered his brain. There are some commentators, as I studied, studied in red, said, you know, he may have only actually had human sacrifice in mind. He was just hoping he would have been in service. On his daughter. What is clear going on here is that he is trying to bargain and cut a deal with God. And we do this today still, don't we? 
Maybe you've done this in the past. Maybe you've prayed a prayer like, God, if you would just do this for me, then I promise, fill in the blank. God, if you would just, just help me out here, if you just pay this bill, that, then I'll start going to church again. Then I'll do that. God, if you would just heal me of this disease, you know, then I'll give all my money to the church. I'll, I'll give it all away. I'll give it to missionaries. I'll do something big. Or maybe you've even had a small desperate one like that at a football game. Like, Lord, if you would please just let them win this <laughs> stupid game, then I promise I will do this. We do that. We try to make deals and bargain with God. But all of those kinds of prayers, those aren't good prayers. Those are prayers that are an attempt to manipulate God. Those are prayers that are trying to get God what we want Him to do. And then if He does what we want, then we'll give Him something. As if He really needs it anyway. Well, we see we're treating Him like He's an ancient forest spirit or a fairy that we need to go and cut a deal with. If we give him something good enough, then he'll give us what we want. And Jephthah's attempt to bargain with God, it ends in complete disaster. It ends in disaster for him personally. And it ends in disaster for them nationally. Personally, what happens? He returns home and the first person who comes out of his house is his daughter. His only child. It's not at all what he hoped for. It's not at all what he had in mind. In 1135, he gives his response. As soon as he saw her, he tears his clothes. It's a symbol of mourning. And he says, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble for me. He's devastated. His response makes it seem like, well, I think he fairly clearly was assuming he'd sacrifice some human being. Consider it a possibility. You also see right away he blames his daughter, not himself. It says, you've done this. You've become a problem. That's what we do too when we sin, right? We, we're quick to blame other people instead of ourselves. Much like Adam in the garden. Well, you gave me this woman, God. It's not my fault that I did this. He doesn't take responsibility yet. And part of the tragedy isn't just that his daughter will die, but it's that his line will be wiped out. He'll have no more children. This is a horrible thing in the ancient world. Like Gideon and Abimelech before him that we've talked about these last few weeks, his entire line will pass. There will be no more descendants. This is an ancient tragedy. Especially for somebody who thinks they're the head of a tribe or a big deal or a king. And a big question for us here is to ask, well, does Jephthah really go through with this? Does he really burn his daughter alive? And there's two options. He either does or he doesn't. And believers disagree on this. I'm going to tell you what I think because well, that's why I'm here. Um, but the first option, right, is that he didn't do it. Because this is evil. This is wrong. This is not something that God wants. This is not portrayed to us as something good. So some would say, and look and say, well, look, Jephthah's mentioned in Hebrews 11 with all these other heroes. How could he be there if he does something so evil and horrific? So maybe he just dedicated her to work at the tabernacle at the temple and worship God. And that's why he was so sad, because he's not going to have any descendants. And then he burned a different kind of burnt offering. Now that's that's one option. It's technically possible, but man, the main reason I think he does is look at this context of this whole book. We've been going through this whole book. We've been just talking about how sinful Israel is and the downfall of their state. And we've looked at all of these heroes, all of these judges, and all of their sinfulness, all of the ways that they fail. Look at Abimelech and Gideon the last couple of weeks. Gideon broke all the Ten Commandments. He worshipped idols. Abimelech was an Israelite king who was worse than all of the other foreign kings. So I, now I think it fits. I think it makes sense that he actually did this. If you would, you can quick turn with me too to Deuteronomy 12, um, verse 29. This is a warning that God gives to Moses before they even go into the land. Before Moses is done, before the time of Joshua. A warning that God gives about this very situation we see in this chapter. He says, When the Lord your God cuts you off from before the nations whom you dispossess, and you dispossess them and you dwell in your land. So in Deuteronomy 12, 29. Take care that you don't be ensnared in following them after they've been destroyed by you. That you don't inquire about their gods and say, well, how did these nations serve their gods that I may do the same? Don't start worshiping their gods. Well, Israel did that. And now, here we have Jephthah 2 worshiping Yahweh, but in the same way that they worshiped their gods. 
31, do not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing the Lord hates they have done for their gods. They even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire of their gods. Well, that sounds like this chapter. Where Israel abandons, they worship the other gods. And even when they come back, Jephthah starts worshiping God like the gods of the nations are worshipped. And he burns his daughter alive. I think it... I think it fits. There's another place that's helpful for us as well. Leviticus 27. You don't have to turn there and read, but you can mark that if you want to look later. It's a, it's a description about how they are to redeem their people. Right? So when you have a firstborn, the firstborn is dedicated to the Lord. So the firstborn either has to go and serve the Lord in tabernacle service, or they can pay some money as an offering to God and redeem their child back. And then it also, before that, it says, if you make a vow, considering a person here, here's how much you got to pay to get out of it. And at the very end, it ends and says, hey, if you can't afford any of this, go to the priest and you'll work something out, whatever you can afford. So there's even already an option here for how Jephthah can get out of this, how he can save his daughter's life. And yet, he doesn't do that. So even if you think, well, maybe he just gave her to the temple, he doesn't take the out that God gives him, either because he's ignorant of God's word or another reason. And Jephthah's daughter, she willingly goes to her death, but she asks for time to mourn. And when this vow is completed, the nation mourns every single year. I, don't think, I think it's weird and strange for all the daughters to gather up for four days out of the year to remember her and weep for her. If she wasn't unjustly killed by her father and willingly went towards it. That's a story that would get remembered and passed down and lamented. Not just that, well, isn't it sad, Jeff, they can't have any more kids. That's kind of a bummer. That doesn't quite have the same ring to it, I think. And the biggest indicator for me is what happens next in chapter 12 with Jephthah. Well, what does he do after all of this, after saving Israel? You notice, too, the whole battle between the other nations is two verses, kind of 32 and 33. Well, they crossed over, they fought them, Lord gave them to their hand, killed them, and then that's it. Now they're done. And then they go back. Well, after, there's another fight that takes even more time. He starts fighting with the Israelites in chapter 12. Ephraim, again, has a complaint. They've had a complaint many times that we've read. They come and are upset that they didn't get invited to the party. And Jephthah doesn't learn from his previous disaster, from what he did with his daughter according to the vow that he made. Instead, he starts fighting right away. Ephraim comes and says they're going to fight him. And just says, great, you want to fight? Let's fight. He doesn't try and diplomatically get out of it. Now we have civil war. And he goes and they kill him. And they take the land from Ephraim. They take all of their land. And it's not even just that they're done. Like, okay, we win, it's over. They also then go and say, and they start testing everybody. And so when anyone comes across the river, they ask them in 12.5, well, are you an Ephraimite? And if they say no, they go, okay, well, we got to test now because you all speak a certain way. So here, say Shib Shibboleth. And if you don't say it the right way, we'll know that you're actually an Ephraimite. And then they seize him and slaughter him. And it says 42,000. 42,000 Israelites are killed. Notice it doesn't say how many Ammonites are killed. It mentions how many Israelites are killed. That's a lot. That's more Israelites killed than have been killed at any point in this book. It's actually more Israelites killed than any other judge has killed of their oppressors. The only one you could get close to is Gideon because there were 120,000. But God killed all of them. When Gideon fought them, there were only 10,000 left. So Jephthah kills four times as many people as Gideon but not of the enemy of their own people. This is sad. And then it ends with, well, and he judged Israel six years. That doesn't seem like a very good ruler. Doesn't seem like he has learned much. It ends in disaster. Nothing really in this passage, I think, shows us as Jephthah as anything righteous or amazing or awesome. His attempt to, to bargain, to deal, to manipulate God ends in disaster. And that's part of why he says, well, no, I have to go through with my vow. I can't take it back. It's because he thinks the only reason that God intervened is because of what he promised. He thinks that his promise is why God showed up. His promise is why God saved them. His promise is why they've received grace. 
as if God didn't do it anyway. I don't even think God chose Jephthah. I think they chose Jephthah, and yet God in his grace showed up and helped him anyway. Because so often we see that God helps us even when we don't deserve it, even when we don't ask for it, even when we don't ask for it in the right ways, even when we do things wrong. Sometimes our God is so amazing and his grace is so wonderful that he gives us blessings that we don't deserve, which is really just about all of them. And so the, the deed of his vows described, it's almost, the author's too afraid to put it into words. It says, he did with her according to his vow that he had made. And so much disaster comes after this. His story as a judge doesn't end with him saving Israel, it ends with him ruining it. The lesson from Jephthah's story, I don't think, is about, you know, make sure you don't make unrash vows. Like, that, that's really what we need to learn. Or maybe we should make promises. I don't think that's what this story is about at all. I think the story is about, do not try to attempt to manipulate God. It can't end anywhere well. And yet we see God's grace in it. Point number three, if you're taking notes, is a reminder that we can offer God nothing. But he offers us everything. We can offer God nothing, but he offers us everything. This is the reality. We can't offer God anything that he needs. God has all the cattle on a thousand hills. God has all of the cosmos and every galaxy and universe in his hands. What do you possibly think you could give him that he needs? Or that he wants? Or that he's, oh man, I don't have one of those yet. Please give me that. That'll help out my collection. Our bargains to God are so meaningless. Do you think that God is sitting up in his throne in heaven looking at you and thinking, man, I really hope that they make a good promise to me today because uh, if they don't, I'm going to be in trouble and I just really, I really need this bargain. It's such a good deal. I've got to make it. I think when Jephthah made his vow that God went, woo, that's a great one. I really hope it's a cow. But need another cow. So come on, Cal. I hope that's what comes out. You got a deal, Jeff. I'll save your whole nation for that. It's just what I need. Do you think we can offer God anything? Like, God, if you, you know, you give me a million dollars, I'll go into ministry. And God says, oh, woo, thank you. I was really hoping that you would. A million dollars is a great deal. It's just what I need. So done. That, that's it. We'll do this. No, God can do whatever he wants. We can't offer him anything that he needs at all. This is why so often God chooses to use nobodies. God chooses to use rejects all throughout. The, his disciples are nobody important or significant. 1 Corinthians tells us he didn't choose the wise and the rich and the powerful of the world. He chooses the weak. He chooses those who have nothing to offer him. He tells his disciples, don't keep the little kids from coming to me. Theirs is the kingdom. Those people who have nothing to bring me, that's who I want. Because those other people, they might think they have something to do with this. God doesn't need us. He doesn't need, doesn't even need amazing, talented people like Billy Graham who reached millions with the gospel, which is wonderful and awesome. But do you think if Billy Graham said no to God's ministry, God would have said, ah, oh, that ruins it. I don't know what I can do now. I really needed Billy Graham so that I can get the gospel out. No, oh, God can do it another way. God's word tells us if all human beings are silent, the very stones will sing out in praises. We don't offer God anything. And yet, He offers us everything. This is a freeing thing to realize. Because the gospel tells us we can't give or offer God anything. And if we can't, that actually sets us free. Because if we can and if God needs it, we're obligated to and we have to. And we've got to do it so we can get Him on our side. And the question is, well, why would God save us? If I offer nothing to Him, what is He doing? How, why would He offer us grace and salvation? It's just because He's so good and so beautiful and His grace is so amazing. That God actually gives us Himself. That He sent His Son Jesus to die for us on the cross. He gave His very life and His blood for us. And He came to fulfill a vow that He made to Adam and Eve that one day he would bruise the serpent's head. And he fulfilled a vow he made to Abraham, that through him all of the nations of the world would be blessed. To fulfill the vow to David, that one day there would be a king whose rule would never end, and peace would go out throughout the whole world. To fulfill a vow he made to Jeremiah, that God would save his people from his sins, 
He would give them a new heart and a better covenant. Jesus came and He gives His very life for us. He died on the cross as a true sacrifice for us. And on that, He purchased our freedom. He gives us life that we do not deserve. He offers us salvation and eternal life. Not because we give Him anything amazing that He has to have, but because He is so wonderful. He gives us what we could never bargain for. The gospel sets us free from trying to manipulate God. The gospel sets us free from trying to earn God's favor. Or earn His action in our lives. God intercedes in our lives, not because we ask Him to, because we have the exact formula and get the words right, and now He's got to act. He intercedes because He is so good and He just loves us. We can't do anything to make Him act. Yet, you see, at the end of this, too, all of these minor judges, these minor judges might seem minor. There's things in there we don't have time to go into all of it. But all these minor judges are another examples of God's grace. He yet again sends people to save them. That God shows up and He gives us so often what none of us deserve. We offer God nothing and yet He gives us everything. Everything. So Christian, stop trying to do anything for God. Don't bargain with God. Don't manipulate Him. Don't try to, to get Him to do what you want to do. Just stop and rest and receive and realize, God, I don't offer you anything. And yet, because of your love, you have given us everything. Eternal life, the water that never runs out, so we'll never thirst again. So rest in that. Receive that. Stop trying to earn God's love because you can't. It is a gift given freely. And because it's given freely, so we receive it that way and then we go and live as His God has given us this wonderful grace. Summary, there's always grace for the repentant. For those who ask for mercy, they will receive it. If that's you this morning, if you want grace, if you long for grace, it is here for you. You are not too far gone. You have not sinned too much. You are not unloving. There's nothing you have to do to earn it. You just have to open your hands and ask God for it. Believe in Him, turn from your sins, and, be re and receive His grace. We've also seen that bargaining with God, it ends in disaster. And we're reminded that we offer God nothing, and yet He gives us everything. So repent and rest in the arms of a loving Savior who loves you. Invite our worship team to come up and, and sing, lead us in one more song. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that you have given us. The grace that we don't deserve. We ask, Lord, that you would help us. Lord, help us to stop trying to earn your love through the things that we do. Set us free from thinking that if we could just do enough, if we read our Bibles enough or went to church enough or served enough, then you would really love us or then you would do what we would want you to do. Lord, would you help us to comprehend the depth of your love for us. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we worship our Lord in song one more time. This uh, benediction from the end of Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. God bless you. Go in peace.